Welcome to the History Guy podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of the History Guy podcast is brought to you by Magellan TV a new kind of streaming service that aims to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. On today's episode, the History Guy talks about two stories of the oft-forgotten Gilded Age. First is the story of how Grover Cleveland snuck aboard a yacht and had a secret surgery to remove a large tumor from his mouth, and kept it a secret for years after his presidency. Then the History Guy will talk about the Harrison Horror, a macabre tale of how medical schools stole bodies from cemeteries and what happened to the only man to be both a son and a father of a U.S. president. And without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. In 1893, the United States was in crisis. A series of global economic issues as well as domestic issues had coalesced into what was called the Panic of 1893, and the economy was in free fall. Unemployment was 43% in Michigan, 35% in New York, 25% in Pennsylvania. The downturn caused a rush on gold by people holding certificates backed by silver that the federal government struggled to pay. Dozens of banks and businesses closed. It was the worst downturn of its kind until the Great Depression. And the last thing that the nation needed was more bad news. When, in May of 1893, Grover Cleveland, who had just been re-elected to a second non-consecutive term as president, found a lump in his cheek. Afraid that the news could cause a panic, the president would have a dangerous surgery that he did not know whether he would survive at a critical time in U.S. history and keep it hidden from the public. Grover Cleveland's secret surgery and the questions it raises about the people's right to know about the health of the executive is history that deserves to be remembered. Grover Cleveland holds a unique position in American history. He is the only president elected to non-consecutive terms. He's the only president to get married in the White House, and he was the only Democratic president to be elected in the American Gilded Age, which came to a close after the cataclysmic political shift that followed the fallout of the 1893 panic. Known as an honest man and sometimes called Grover the Good, he was seen as a man of virtue in an era of deep corruption. Though Cleveland had alienated many important sections in his first term, he still won the popular vote in the election of 1888, but he lost the Electoral College to Benjamin Harrison. One of the primary political conflicts of the era was between Silverites, who supported a policy of free silver or unlimited minting of silver money. The issue was that silver was much less valuable than gold, and much less than the face value of what they were minted into. It caused serious inflation, which benefited debt-strapped farmers who figured that while their debts would remain the same, they would have more money to pay them. Naturally, this was disadvantageous to banking, business, and financial interests, who opposed the bimetallist policy and preferred remaining on the gold standard. Cleveland had fought the Silverite forces during his first term, and Harrison in the intervening term had signed the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, which significantly increased how much silver the government bought. The Sherman Act created a run on gold that threatened the stability of the economy, and though it was only part of what caused the 1893 panic, Cleveland saw it as a threat that had to be removed immediately. But that was before he discovered the tumor. Cleveland had been a lifelong smoker, and the growth was on the left side of his mouth, where he chewed his cigars and tobacco. When he first noticed the lump, he took a mirror and found a crater-like ulcer with a granulated surface. The tumor continued to grow, and on June 18th, he had Dr. O'Reilly, the White House doctor, take a look. O'Reilly described it as the size of a quarter. He removed a small piece and had it sent anonymously to the Army Medical Museum. The pathologist diagnosed it as an epithelioma, a growth that could be either benign or malignant, though he wasn't sure which one it was. The cancer continued to grow, and Cleveland's young wife recalled that it caused him to walk the floor at night. His personal physician, Joseph Brand, advised that it is a bad-looking tenant. Were it in my mouth, I would have it removed at once. Unfortunately, it wasn't that simple. Even unaware of the cancer, one financial editor wrote that Mr. Cleveland is about all that stands between this country and absolute disaster, and his death would be a great calamity. Cleveland, called Uncle Jumbo, was not in robust health besides, and the 57-year-old suffered from gout and rheumatism. 
Cleveland feared that if word got out that he was terminally ill in the middle of the political battle over silver, it would weaken his political position and imperil the country. The president agreed to have the operation, but on the condition that it remained a closely held secret. Even Adlai Stevenson, the vice president, would not be told. He chose to have the surgery aboard the yacht of his close friend, Elias Benedict. Benedict was a wealthy banker and was considered one of America's leading yachtists. His boat, the Oneida, was a 142-foot long pleasure boat on which Cleveland had already logged nearly 50,000 nautical miles sailing and fishing. The public and press wouldn't think it odd then, they reasoned, for him to take a four-day fishing trip over the 4th of July. Dr. Bryant put together a team of six surgeons to perform the surgery, led by Dr. William King, a pioneering brain surgery who had, in 1888, performed one of the first successful brain tumor removals. They were all sworn to keep the details of the surgery a secret. They would each make their way to the United's dock in New York City from different locations on the night of June 30th, with Cleveland and Benedict arriving later that evening. Dr. Keene was in charge of preparing the ship for the surgery, which included removing all the furniture from the ship's saloon, except for an organ, which was nailed down. For a surgery table, they last a chair to a mast in order to keep it stable. Keene also arranged to have necessary medical supplies, including tanks of oxygen and nitrous oxide, secretly brought aboard. The plan was to perform the surgery while the ship was sailing across Long Island Sound and to deposit the president afterwards at Gray Gables, his summer home in Massachusetts, where his wife was anxiously waiting. The president hoped that doing the surgery in early July would give him enough time to recover before Congress returned in August. If performing a delicate surgery on a large tumor in the president's mouth on a moving ship while the patient is strapped to a chair sounds difficult and dangerous, you'd be right. The situation was made even more perilous by the science of the time. Only during the 19th century had proper oncology and pathology studies been possible, and while improvements had been made, doctors were limited in their ability to perform delicate surgery and prevent infection. The doctors were talented, but not necessarily experienced at this kind of surgery. They would be removing part of the president's jaw, and while Dr. Bryant had written a paper examining similar procedures, he had only performed two of them himself. The ship's crew were told only that the president was having some teeth removed, a story that would be repeated to the press. As the ship set sail on July 1st, the party was blessed with good, calm weather. They began the surgery about noon. The doctors made no external incisions, instead using a mirror-backed light to illuminate the mouth, as well as a lure cheek retractor, which Keene had brought from Europe. The president was given nitrous oxide as anesthetic. As the doctors performed the surgery, they discovered that the tumor was a large, gelatinous mass that extended upward, coming close to the president's eye. A large part of the jawbone and hard palate was removed by chisel, as well as five teeth. There was remarkably little blood loss, and after only an hour and a half, the surgery was successfully completed, and the president's mouth filled with gauze. Matthew Algio, who wrote a book about the surgery, says modern doctors marvel at this operation. The doctor successfully completed a difficult surgery in half the time it would take to be done today and on a moving boat. The size of the tumor and the amount of bone removed caused lasting disfigurement to the president's face, which, while partially hidden by his famous mustache, also affected his speech. Later, a rubber prosthetic was made that restored both Cleveland's appearance and his voice. The Oneida arrived in Massachusetts on July 5th, and Cleveland was reportedly recovering well. Dr. Bryant and Dr. Keene stayed to perform a smaller surgery, this one with the new technique of electrocautery. By the end of July, Cleveland was fishing again, enjoying himself and looking healthy. It seemed that the whole operation had gone off without anyone the wiser. But two months later, a crack in the story appeared. There had been rumors that the president had been diagnosed with cancer, but they had been easily quashed. It wasn't until the end of August that somebody slipped up. Elisha J. Edwards was a successful reporter working for the Philadelphia Press as their New York correspondent. He was at the pinnacle of his career and had a popular syndicated column he wrote six days a week. He was approached by a Dr. Leander Jones at the end of August who began his conversation. We have narrowly escaped, I think, having Vice President Stevenson transferred from the Senate chamber to the White House as president. Jones then related the remarkable tale of the secret surgery and that a tumor had been removed on the boat. Edwards was understandably shocked. Jones told him that the source was a dentist, Dr. Hasbroke, one of the physicians who had assisted with the surgery. Jones was sure the story would get out, and so felt no regret passing the story along, but Edwards needed more corroboration before he was willing to put his reputation on the line. 
He tracked down Dr. Hasbrook at his home and related the story as he had heard it. Hasbrook was aghast. Some of the physicians who were aboard the yacht must have told you that story, he said. You could not have obtained it any other way. Seeing that it was already out, Hasbrook told Edwards everything and added that the president was expected to make a full recovery. Ecstatic, Edwards ran to his office to write the story, worried that someone else would write it before he did. I had the newspaper man's desire to be the first to publish important news, he said. So sensitive was the information that once he wrote it down, he refused to trust anyone to telegraph it to Philadelphia and instead used a telephone call to call it into the office of the Philadelphia Press. Newspapers didn't use huge banner headlines much yet, so the title of Edwards' piece didn't stand out, but the content of it did. The president, a very sick man, it began. Edwards was something of a rarity. He wasn't one for using the sensational writing that so defined the period of yellow journalism. He emphasized the character and strength of the president while describing the surgery with remarkable accuracy. Privately, even Dr. King called the article a good scoop, while publicly denying every part of it. During the Gilded Age, cancer was almost taboo. Edwards doesn't use the word, but instead describes Cleveland's ailment as that dread and mysterious enemy which physicians scarcely dare to name, and suggested its similarity to the horrific mouth tumor that had taken former President Grant eight years prior. Edwards was very careful about how he wrote the article, offering excuses for why the doctors lied, and writing that Cleveland only wished to keep people from being overwhelmed by anxiety and suspense. He also reported that the tumor was benign and that the president was no longer in any danger. Other papers that reported in the wake of the revelations were less composed. He had a cancer, said the San Francisco Morning Call. Predictably, the administration denied the claims entirely. Cleveland suffered only from some rheumatism and a short tooth, representatives said, and any reports to the contrary were sheer nonsense. Edwards only identified two of the six doctors, Hasbrook and Cleveland's physician, Dr. Bryant, and Bryant insisted that nothing dramatic at all had occurred on board the Oneida. The other doctors were silent as well. The administration launched a coordinated smear campaign to discredit the report. Newspapers declared Edwards a disgrace to journalism. Cleveland recruited his friends to stonewall other reporters looking to corroborate the story. One of them, editor of a newspaper himself, wrote an open letter that said if the president was sick, his closest friends do not know. Benedict told reporters at the New York World that the report was all bosh and that Cleveland hadn't been at all impaired. He never missed a meal. Even the steward of the United stuck to the story, claiming he had seen Cleveland on deck every day. On Cleveland's return trip to Washington with his wife, then nine months pregnant, Cleveland made himself visible and chose to walk at times he would normally have taken a carriage. The New York Times reported that his actions be so command enjoying perfect health. On September 6, Cleveland hosted a reception for doctors attending the Pan American Medical Congress, mingling with the guests and thanking them all in a short speech. There was no evidence that he had ever been ill. The ordeal ruined Edwards. His career stalled, and for the next 15 years, he struggled to find work. He finally got a job in 1909 with a struggling Wall Street Journal, but his reputation was beyond repair. The health of the president remains an important subject, but even today there is still no clear law or standard regarding what must be publicly released about the president's health. From the drama of President Garfield's slow death after being shot by an assassin in 1880, to Franklin Delano Roosevelt's health and efforts to hide the extent of his disability due to polio, the public interest in knowing that their leader is healthy and strong has weighed against issues of privacy and politics. Cleveland surgery is only one of many illnesses covered up by the White House. For 18 months, the White House concealed that President Wilson had been paralyzed by a severe stroke. President Harding had a heart attack that was reported as food poisoning until he died six days later. Cleveland would persevere through a tumultuous second term, but in 1896, the Silverites took control of the Democratic Party and nominated William Jennings Bryan over Cleveland. He continued to express his opinions and offer advice. Occasionally his name would come up as a potential candidate for president or senate, but he essentially retired from politics. In 1908, he had a heart attack. Passed away June 24th, the age of 71. His last words were, I have tried so hard to do right. It wasn't until 1917, 24 years after the surgery and nine years after Cleveland's death, that Dr. Keene published the tale of the secret surgery in full in the Saturday Evening Post to vindicate Mr. Edwards' character as a truthful correspondent. Only then was the story accepted to be true, and Edwards received hundreds of letters of congratulation. He's finally given credit for one of the biggest scoops in American history.
And there is one more postscript to the story that didn't come out until 1980, 87 years after the surgery aboard the Oneida. It turns out the president's tumor had been preserved all those years. And modern analysis determined it to be a verrucous carcinoma, a growth of considerable less risk than some had feared. If you want to see that actual tumor, it is on display with other medical oddities at the Mutur Museum of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. So the pair of episodes we were talking about today are two of my favorite historical stories, and that's not just because I wrote them. Uh, I have a special place in my heart for the Gilded Age in general, um, <laughs> which I feel like is a really neglected period of American history. Uh, some really cool stuff was going on at that time, but you know these days we we don't remember it very well. So I, I'm glad that we were able to talk about these really interesting stories that were big stories at the time, even though they've completely they've just completely fallen by the wayside. It's you know it's interesting. I mean, there's periods in American history that just you don't get them in academic study. I mean, because you're usually you know doing some sort of survey class that's trying to cover all of American history, and so it's left this period from the Civil War really up until the First World War is kind of a blind spot. There's very little discussion even of the Spanish American War, uh, but I mean it's really a dynamic period in American history, uh, and a lot of exciting things happened. Uh, it really did define uh, our relationship with the world rolling into the 20th century, which was was part of how we interacted in the First World War and the Second World War. Uh, our relationships to the reason that we came in on the side of Britain as opposed to Germany, a lot of that is defined by what we were doing in that period. And I mean, there was a period during Cleveland's administration where we almost went crossways with England that had that occurred. I mean, we might have been on the opposite sides uh, in the in the First and Second World War, if you think about that. And that's that's extraordinary to understand what we were doing. And of course, it was also the period of American imperialism. It was a period of uh, great uh, wealth disparity. Uh, I mean, the reason they call it the Gilded Age, I mean, because things that are gilded is just gold that's hammered over something that's much cheaper than gold. And obviously, the idea is that we had some people living in extreme wealth, but you also had people living in extreme poverty. Of course, the transformation of the nation because of the, the great migration uh, of, of blacks from the south uh, to the industrial areas, as well as a massive uh, I immigration, uh, foreign immigration coming through the ports in New York, and I mean, the, the period of the Statue of Liberty. And uh, so, it, I mean, it's just an absolutely amazing period. Uh, that really defined the nation uh, and that we just barely talk about, I guess, because we in general weren't at war. But I mean, we, we were even in the West and, and that's even, it's still, I mean, that's, you see yeah. that more as John Wayne movies is, you, it just really is something that it feels like there's so much in there that is so interesting that it's just kind of so forgotten to Americans that if you try to ask them what was going on in America in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, uh, you, you really don't get much. You know, you, I don't know that you'll get an answer. I, I mean, honestly, I think that in general, if you just went to school, that you think that we had the Civil War and then we were, you know, in the First World War. It was transformative, absolutely. And it, it's, it's. I, I read a biography of all the presidents through the Gilded Age at this point. And it's uh, it's just a very interesting, it's it's amazing how contentious it was because we kind of, you know, we, we brush over it, but man, you know, the people who were living in it, that was their life every day. And it, it sometimes makes me wonder, you know, stuff that we find so important today and that seemed to be big huge issues i wonder if you know 50 years from oh, now, no one will even remember I, them, right? I see that all the time because you can go back i mean we're always digging in old newspapers and, if, and i'll be looking at one thing in a newspaper and i'll see there's a headline there and I'm like i've never heard of that and so if you think about it every day in the news there's something that's on the headline of the newspaper uh, every single day so how much of that are we going to remember in a year or 10 years or 100 years so it was big enough to make the front page of the newspaper at some point uh, and then it got uh, overrun by other events. Uh, and so, yeah, and that's, I mean, but that's true of any period. We, but we're talking there in a, in a particularly dynamic period that was particularly forgotten. We almost think about there's nothing going on there. Of course, we were, de we were developing our monetary policy, our economic policy. We were developing the roles of the federal government as a working relationship to the people. Uh, and some of the most amazing yeah. people in U.S. history were there. It just wasn't a period where, you know, you, you recognize the heroism. It, it was a period, by the way, where the the bulk of the presidents through the Gilded Age had fought in the Civil War, where, I mean, we, we rarely had a period where you had so many presidents that came from military experience. Uh, and yet it was a period, you know, where we weren't really fighting the war. And it, it's, it, there's just so much to look at that. It's so fascinating. It's, it's really an interesting time. Of course, the time of robber barons. And I mean, we've got so much that we've got to discuss in there, our relationships with foreign governments. Possibly our best friend through the era was Russia, yeah. which is you know now you know almost the opposite. And it's just it's just a really interesting period to talk about. So it's fun and it's fun to discuss yeah. because uh, as a channel that focuses on forgotten history, 
Uh, there's just a whole lot of forgotten history there, a whole lot of stuff that we just haven't kept track of. Track of that's now you know fascinating to go to go listen to. And speaking of all of these things that have been forgotten, Grover Cleveland is a president who is probably only remembered for about two things usually is that he has a very weird name and that he had the split presidency mm -hmm. that he was president two times he really deserves more credit than that he was an interesting guy but like we were saying it's interesting for us to talk about how how people forget because cleveland was was also a contentious oh, yeah. guy at the time the mudslinging in the papers over over this child that was maybe not his but that he claimed as his own and stuff uh, it was i mean it was an interesting and, and were, i don't even know if that would be a scandal today but i mean certainly it was a, a scandal at the time uh and yeah uh, uh what was that the, the political cartoon hey i'm trying to remember exactly what that line was the political cartoon hey ma where's my pa or something like that yeah but but he was also known for being honest and that's one, one of the things that, and he was you know uh, yeah. it's uh interesting to talk about his health because you know that's an issue it's been an issue certainly with the last two administrations where they talk about it all the time and are we really sure that the president is healthy? And here you have this dude that was clearly yeah. didn't take good care of himself. <laughs> he had congestive no. heart failure and he had uh, diabetes and uh, he had gout and, and uh, he, he was definitely overweight. And, uh, and yeah, so, I mean, there's it's a lot there. It's a lot to chew on in administration. And again, if you ask the average American, hey, who's Grover Cleveland? Uh, they might not even be able to guess what, what you know century he was a president, you know, more or less what, you know, what was going on in his time. And he and he did some important stuff. I mean, his the whole fight over uh, bimetallism and the gold standard, yeah. and that I mean, that was the time of William Jennings Bryan. And these are these are people who I mean, at the time, uh, Jennings Bryan was as big a populist leader as almost mm -hmm. anyone who's ever been a populist in the United States. And yet he never managed to get to the presidency, and has again kind of fallen yeah. fallen out a, of history. As a former teacher of public speaking, he was a famous uh, speaker. He was one of the most famous speakers in American history. Still didn't make it to the presidency. And that issue, actually, bimetallism, the gold standard, the silver standard, so divided the nation, actually defined a lot of monetary policy that still affects us today. And so it's it's really uh, it yeah. seems like it's overly technical stuff and who really understands that and actually at the time it really was a difference about how much you know how much money we were going to have in the nation and how you can make money in the nation and how we back the currency was very very important uh, so it's uh, again uh, you come down to this era uh, that's uh, it's it's full of contradictions it's full of crises uh, it's uh, full of decisions that would make huge impacts in the coming century uh, and we you know we miss it yeah, we, we, we forget about it on, on, on yeah. the standard of history because some of the stuff is just, it doesn't seem as interesting as, you know, talking about, the, you know, how do you ignore the First World War, Second World War or whatever. Uh, but uh, you, you, you got to, you got to, when you go back to it, you got to realize so much of what we are as a nation today uh, was defined then and, and issues that we're still facing, controversies we're still facing today were a part of it. Yeah. It's also a period of significant labor unrest. Uh, it was a period as we were defining our uh, voting rights. Yeah. Uh, it was, I mean, it was just a, it was a fascinating period of, that, that really changed and transformed it. Dynamic and exciting. And, and uh, it was a period when we went from a backwater uh, into, you know, eventually an international force. Uh, it was a period where we moved, we decided we wanted to be imperialists like everybody else. And we eventually ended up, you know, doing that. Uh, and uh, a period of vast economic growth. Uh, and it just, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, you put yeah. it all together and it's, it's, it's so much more interesting than, than what we generally get as a, as a read to it. So I wish everybody would do what you've done, which I actually haven't done, which is go to read a biography of every president through the Gilded Age, uh, because there's, there's so much more there to realize that, and that we might have. And we've talked about some great people in there. We talked about Lou Wallace, we talked about John Hay, uh, and, uh, and of course we also talked about, you know, Lincoln's son, who who was an important, uh, actually, political figure throughout the entire period, and uh, so it's it's yeah. uh, some of those people. I mean, they're if if they had been presidents during the war, we would remember them as some of the best presidents in history, and and or or some of the most important you know, diplomats in history, and and you know instead they're kind of you know lost in the, in the, in an odd part. And you know that's it's funny to me when you would think if we're just chatting around. So I wonder how do you study you know history in the United Kingdom. Uh, because uh, certainly all this period that we're talking about here, I mean, the same thing was going on in England, but they also have another you know, thousand years of history yeah. that they <laughs> that you're trying to keep track. Try every, yeah. every king and and well, you go back far enough there, and there 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 are multiple kings. Yeah. <laughs> in, so I mean, how many Americans can name all the presidents in order? 
then go go to the United Kingdom and say, okay, name every king of the uh, of the United Kingdom from. Uh... I think there might still be some disagreement over which ones were official kings. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, you spend a lot of time, say, talking about the Tudors, but because you forget, because you spend that much time talking about the Tudors in history at the time, you know, uh, it was the Henry that had all the sons that led into the War of the Roses. And, but, I mean, imagine imagine trying to keep track, because, I mean, talking about what the stuff we're talking about here, that's modern history in, in, in British yeah. vision. Uh, and how do you how do you keep back, you know, all of that? And uh, and it, it's not just, I mean, I guess we're sounding like, you know, Anglophiles here, but, I mean, it, that's true in any place you go in the world. Uh, yeah. How you talk about Chinese history, but also, how do you, I mean, uh, Swedish history or Russian history. Or, uh, so it's interesting because uh, as Americans, we have a relatively recent political history, and yet there's still yeah. huge gaps in that in the study, because in the time we take studying history, we pick out, you know, six, seven events, and we focus so much time on them that the other stuff is just sort of, you know, a string in yeah. between. And I think that, I mean, speaking of this episode specifically, I think it's a great, it, it ends up being just a great representation of the whole era. Because this is a man who was considered Grover the Good. He was honest. Mm -hmm. And he lies about this so firmly and so yeah it destroys destroys a career a journalist career on the line but uh, this would be a huge important scandalous earth-shaking lie today to find out that the president yeah. had a, a, a cancerous tumor and just said no i was out fishing uh, and and had that tumor removed and didn't tell anybody about it and that, that would be a significant deal today uh, and it, it would be a, i mean there are questions today about the the president's health and and how yeah. much of that is public does the public get to know and and uh, you know does the president have any right to privacy at all in terms of their own health and uh, you know there's actually no law that requires that we know the, pre the the health of the president there's nothing that says the president could have cancer and not tell you about it it just would be impossible to hide today it would be significant so but it's interesting though that and and because they were afraid uh, that if he appeared to be in ill health then that would you know shatter other things that were being barely held together especially on bimetallism yeah. Uh, and so it's it's you know it's interesting uh, because uh, it just wouldn't I mean today there's just too much communication for you to be able to hide it. But the, the extent that they went to do it, I mean, imagine having yeah. surgery on a boat. Yeah, you, they just they they strap you to the the mast basically, uh -huh. and they're like, that'll be good enough. And, and hope um, that, you know, hope that you don't hit a really big wave at a really bad time. Yeah, it's crazy. It's it's crazy, and I I the, the state of medical technology at that time. It's it is. A miracle that he lived through it and quite aside from the fact that they managed to hide it and that was using this new technology of you know how do we how do we create this this prosthetic that was incredible that we that they were able to do that and that that ties into this story yeah, and that have a rubber they, bit in his mouth there and yeah, just hide the and, they, and no one ever knew no one no one knew for for decades even though one of the guys who was actually there thought that the the whole the jig was up and started 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 blabbing yeah they were able to keep yeah. it yeah crazy that they were yeah, able this, to keep that and, you know, we secret. talk about this we talk about today we can still talk about the press today or press bias today or what we really learn or whatever but i mean nothing nothing that we face today is anything like it was then that you could actually have allies of the president that were such close allies of the president that they would hide something like this i mean it's, yeah. it's just astounding uh, and, and you know it's hard to say what does that what does that mean for the nation i mean how different would things have been if he just told people i'm having the surgery if we did like you said you know when it was uh, determining these these large monetary policies and stuff like that, their concern was that I mean they could have lost what was going on in Congress at that time, and I mean that could have had some significant effects. It's hard to know. Yeah, it might have effects on the next election, but I mean it's it's also interesting because now if the president has to go under any kind of procedure that's going to have him you know under uh, anesthesia, uh, then you know it's a big deal, and then you the vice president put a bunker and you know sure they're because they're, they're, you're afraid whatever the you know the ruskies can launch their missiles at us right when the president's you know yeah. his tooth removed or whatever uh and uh it's a thing you can tell the vice president he didn't even know didn't even know didn't even let they him just know. try to keep the the as few people knowing as possible and they're just like yeah we, he's not he's not that important um well that's crazy but that you know it, it's interesting because this is a period where there's presidential assassinations too during the golden yeah. age and and somehow we just they have never thought of the vice president as this guy's going to take charge and uh, I, so and yeah. they even though they had you know and they i mean they really treated them as, as a as a nobody so i think we we at least think more about our vice presidents now than we did then yeah at least the possibility you know, they're not just out, you know, vacationing in the back or something like that. And like, oh, suddenly you're president now. Yeah, I didn't even oh, thought about it. I hadn't talked to the guy in the last six months. You know? 
there was there was one I was just looking at I think and it earlier than the Gilded Age to Franklin Pierce's vice president he's the only uh vice president to have taken the oath of office not on American soil <laughs> uh, because what? he was in Cuba uh, trying to escape like tuberculosis and he died like a month into his what? into his <laughs> we have to write that episode yeah uh, yeah, that and, was and so fascinating because among the people they didn't tell was the person that had the surgery gone sideways would have suddenly been president of the United States. And I guess it didn't trust him. Uh, and and uh, because that's how they you know balance tickets. It's it's yeah. it makes the story that much more interesting. I mean it's all around an interesting story. It's interesting how they did this. Of course, you know, being the president, he managed to get the best treatment of most people in America that if they had this wouldn't have gotten this kind of treatment, but he got the best treatment on earth and, and uh, got the most modern treatment of the time. Uh, if you imagine doing that without without good anesthesia, without without antibiotics, and I mean all the things that we would you know take for granted today, uh, but uh, uh, that he was able to keep it secret is just astounding. That they chose to do it on a boat, and, and how they chose to do it on the boat, how they kept it secret. It's a really good story. It's a ripping yarn. It's a, it's a story yeah. worth telling and listening to. But it also comes down to you, like, how is this real? I mean, how did, how could this happen? Yeah, and, and we yeah. and we forgot about it. <laughs> yeah, this and is it, something that people don't talk about, and the, it's, yeah, it's just unless, incredible. Unless they're you know at the school of medical oddities and they see his tumor there, and they're like, oh, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. So it's <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you so now if you ask people who Grover Cleveland is, they'll have three things to remember: that he had a funny name, that he had two presidencies, and that he had cancer removed while he was president, and they and they saved it. You mentioned at the start, too, that you had written the episode. I think people ask questions about that in terms of behind the scenes. We have a, a few people who write episodes. Uh, on, I write many of the episodes. It's not that just, you know, it's not that just me reading other people's scripts. Uh, uh, the bulk of the episodes that are actually on the channel I've written. Uh, but I have several other writers, and Josh is a chief writer right now, and he works full-time with us now as a chief writer, and he's writing maybe half the episodes now uh, and writes fantastic episodes. But all of the writers have their own voice. And if you're ever interested, you can go into the description. It will say script by uh, and uh, JCG is Josh Geiger and THG is me, the history guy. And then there's other writers, of course, uh, and you can see those written there. So you can see who's written the particular episode. And it's, it's interesting to hear those different voices. And you can really see different passions in there. And that's one of the ones that you see in these two particular episodes. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and we're really happy that they're able to continue supporting this podcast and making it possible and supporting the channel as well. And so on the podcast, we like to talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so one of the things that I was watching recently, it's called the Mil Milau Viaduct. And it's French, so I'm probably mispronouncing that. It's a giant bridge, and it was something I had not heard of. And essentially, instead of crossing a, a river, it's crossing a gorge. And so it goes from plateau to plateau. And apparently it's the tallest, currently still, the tallest bridge ever built. And it is an absolutely impressive thing. It's considered one of the 21st century's engineering marvels. Watching it be built, which is what this is about, it's truly an incredible sight, honestly, just seeing this, this giant bridge in this gorge. And that's one of those things that Magellan does well, is they tell an incredible story about how they were able to build this thing and why. And then also just have amazing shots of this bridge it's just an absolutely incredible documentary on a different note what have you been watching on magellan tv lately it's a, you know a lot uh, and you know we do a lot with magellan tv but I, I was just looking through and i and i saw one that was about the discoveries that came from hubble and that's interesting to me because we've just been talking about you know hubble had issues they just brought it back to scientific study i remember when hubble launched and it, there were problems with Hubble and, and uh, they had, had to go fix it with space shuttle. It was almost kind of a running joke. And in between, uh, it has discovered so much. And I'm, I'm not a technologist. We love to talk about technology in space here, but we'd love to try to, you know, to narr that, narrate that into uh, layman's terms because that's, that's what I am. So it's really interesting because uh, it's called Hubble's Universe. It's multiple episodes. They're, they're very easy to digest. They're five, six, seven minutes long. They uh, really give you an idea of the science of how Hubble, Hubble is making the discoveries that it is, as well as how important those discoveries are. And I love to see the ooh and ah sort of pictures of astronomy out there. If you enjoy science, if you enjoy space, if you want something that uh, you can watch pretty quickly, which I, I enjoy it. Sometimes I, I'm really wanting to sit down for a 90 minute documentary, but sometimes I, I've only got five or six minutes in between. This is one of those, this, this sort of one where you can watch that really quickly. And uh, the visuals are astounding and it's it's narrated by people who really know what they're talking about. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, Magellan TV, as, as we've always said, it's just an incredible service. They've got so many documentaries. Well, we will never run out of something to watch. Yeah. New stuff going up all the time and uh, covering a really broad swath of, of information. If you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always get a special deal if you go to 
try.magellantv.com slash history guy. There will be an offer up there for you. I think right now it's a deal off of an annual membership, but sometimes you'll get something like a 30% a, off an annual membership. Of course, I don't know when we say now, I don't know when you're going to listen to this podcast. So uh, the deal does change now and again, but it's always a fantastic deal. And it's really not expensive. Uh, and for a service that you'll end up using a, a whole lot. I mean, I use it all the time. Absolutely worth the time and money. Next, the history guy is going to tell the story of the Harrison Horror and what happened to John Scott Harrison, the only man to be both the son of and the father of a U.S. president. It was May 30th, 1878, and John Harrison, the grandson of former President William Henry Harrison, was at the Medical College of Ohio searching. He was searching for the body of a friend whose grave had been disturbed and whose body had been stolen ten days previously. Through the help of a Cincinnati detective, they had found out that there had been a delivery to the Medical College of Ohio 3 a.m. the previous morning of something white that was presumed to be a cadaver. They searched the grounds and they made some dis disturbing discoveries, but they didn't find the body of his friend. And they'd almost given up when they found a hidden trap door, underneath which was a taut rope. They pulled it up to find out that it was hanging a human body with a sheet over the head. From the age of the cadaver, Harrison didn't think it could be his friend, but the detective suggested that he look at the face anyway, just to be sure. They pulled back the sheet, and Harrison, to his horror, realized that he recognized the face. It's father, he gasped. John Scott Harrison had been buried just the previous day only to have his body snatched and discovered by his own son at a medical school. The body snatching of John Scott Harrison, a former congressman and son of United States president, represented a macabre practice that had gone on for centuries, but also illustrated the challenges of a new scientific age. It is history that deserves to be remembered. On May 25th, 1878, John Scott Harrison, the only man to be both the son and the father of a U.S. president, died at his home. He was the last surviving child of W.H. Harrison, the ninth president of the United States, although he died a mere 31 days into his tenure. He was buried in Congress Green Cemetery in Ohio, near President Harrison's tomb. While burying the body, John Scott's sons, including future President Benjamin, noticed that the grave of a friend, Augustus Devon, who had died ten days earlier, looked disturbed. Realizing that their friend's body had been stolen, the aghast men were terrified that the same could happen to their father, and so they took precautions. He was already in a masonry vault, but as an added precaution, they had several large stone slabs, so large that, quote, their weight required the efforts of sixteen strong men to overcome, placed atop the casket, and then they had the whole thing sealed in concrete. As a further precaution, they hired a watchman to look over the grave for 30 days. In the mid-19th century, body snatching was common practice. The teams of men, and sometimes women, who stole the bodies were often known as resurrectionists or resurrection men, and had developed sophisticated means of robbing the graves of fresh bodies, which they again sell to medical colleges, who desperately demanded bodies for use in the study of surgery and anatomy. The 19th century was something of a renaissance for American medical science. In 1800, there were only four medical colleges in the country, but by 1900, there were more than 160. The growing professionalism and needs of the colleges necessitated demand for bodies to be used for teaching, especially as medical teaching became more focused on anatomy. In 1824, physician Charles Knowlton was arrested for illegal dissection, which he defended by saying, the value of any art or science should be determined by the tendency it has to increase the happiness or to diminish the misery of mankind. The controversy wasn't new. The conflict between doctors seeking to become more knowledgeable and effective and the social mores of respecting the dead repeatedly boiled over dozens of times in the late 18th and 19th centuries. In 1788, a riot known as the Doctor's Riot broke out in New York City over bodies of poor people being stolen, especially from predominantly black cemeteries. Laws such as the Massachusetts Anatomy Act of 1831 sought to strike a balance between the two. In most states, it was legal to dissect the bodies of convicted criminals who had been sentenced to death. But the supply of such bodies was not nearly enough to meet the medical school's demand. The Harrisons had taken every precaution for their beloved father, but the resurrectionists seemed to know how the body had been buried, because they dug at the foot of the grave and burrowed through the brick casing instead of from the head of the grave, as was the usual strategy. 
it wasn't uncommon for teams of resurrectionists to have mourners, often women, view the burial to report on the condition of the body and the burial. The watchman was a suspect, but claimed that he'd been spooked in the dark and chosen not to go to the grave at all, although some reports suggest the watchman had fled the city. Though rampant, medical colleges tended to get away with buying bodies from resurrectionists because the bodies were usually of poor, undesirable groups, and it was even sometimes legal to do so. The body snatching of John Scott Harrison received national attention as both he and the former president were well-liked, and papers as far away as Helena, Montana, and even Dundee, Scotland reported on it. It brought back into terrible focus the horrors of anatomy research that stood in the 19th century. The Harrisons were national figures, with Benjamin standing as a leading Republican in Illinois, recently defeated for a seat in Congress there, and John Scott having served in the House for a time. When John Harrison showed up at the Medical School of Ohio armed with a search warrant and accompanied by a police detective, a janitor named J.Q., who was described as obnoxious and protesting, showed them around. They found several disturbing things, including the body of a black woman who they described as being chipped at, a box full of severed limbs, and the body of an infant, but they didn't find any sign of Augustus Devon. It was only when the police detective, a man named Thomas Snellbaker, had the janitor tailed that they discovered the trapdoor with the hidden body. The janitor was arrested, but the faculty of the college quickly put up the $5,000 bail. Carter Harrison discovered the disturbed grave and rushed to deliver the news to John and the searchers in Cincinnati. When they met, Carter and John exchanged the terrible news. First that the body had been stolen, and then that it had already been discovered. The Ottawa, Illinois Free Trader suggested that the doctors had targeted John Scott specifically to study his sudden death, while the Philadelphia Times expressed the dismay of the nation. Much surprise is expressed that the leading medical college should be caught in desecrating the grave of an honored citizen, and that the faculty had no comment except to say that the discovery was just their luck. The sons of the elder Harrison were in dismay. Carter Harrison was said to have been quite overpowered by the discovery. Dr. Robert Bartholow, dean of the college faculty, expressed his regret that John Scott's body had been taken, but denied any wrongdoing, claiming that the resurrectionist's identity was unknown to the faculty, and that the janitor had no knowledge of the transaction, and that no member of the faculty or students had touched the body. Benjamin wrote an anguished open letter in response. While he lay upon your table, the long white beard, which the hands of infant grandchildren had often stroked in love, was rudely shorn from his face. Have you so little care of your college that an unseen and unknown man may do all this? Benjamin had a source in the form of a Dr. Seeley who claimed to know the identity of the grave robber, but when he was pressed, he clammed up, apparently worried about his own complicity. The Harrisons believed that the college faculty had gotten to the man first. A second search by Benjamin, this time with Pinkerton detectives, turned up his father's clothes, shoved in the building's rafters. This convinced the future president that the college had deliberately hidden the body and that they were hiding their complicity. God keep you from that taste of hell which comes with the discovery of a father's grave robbed and the body hanging by the neck like a dog in the pit of a medical college, he lamented in the paper. The enraged citizens might have repeated the violence of New York's anatomy riots, but Benjamin Harrison was a cautious man who was cognizant of his position as a Hoosier political leader, and he sought to calm them down. Still, he insisted he would use every available means to make sure that the perpetrators were brought to justice, and he initiated both civil and criminal actions. The reburial of John Scott Harrison, as well as the college's protests that the attention was hurting their craft, kept the newspapers and the public frothing. Crowds milled in the alley where Mr. Harrison's body had been dumped, trying to get a look inside, and one paper lamented, What can we do with the bodies of our loved and lost ones to save them from the ignominy of the shoot and windless and dissecting knife of the medical college? News soon broke that the scandal was larger than they imagined. Nearby Miami College, which during the summer was mostly empty during the day, was being used by a man who, among other aliases, used the name Dr. Morton to store corpses which were then being sent all over the area, essentially a clearinghouse for the trade in cadavers. A janitor at Miami College uh, confessed that Dr. Morton had been packing bodies away in the basement of the college all summer and sending them to towns all over the region packed in barrels labeled Quimby and Company. It was that break that allowed them to finally find the body of Augustus Devon, stored in a vat of brine at the University of Michigan. 
Real name, Charles Morton, the doctor was a medical school dropout who moved and sold hundreds of bodies in the region. He arrived in Cincinnati in March with a blonde woman he called his wife, told his neighbors he was a doctor and that he loved night fishing, which is why he was gone at all hours of the night. While Devon was reburied on June 16th, a month after he had first been buried, John Scott Harrison was brought to the tomb of a family friend where it would be safe till it would eventually be brought back to its original resting place near his home in North Bend, Ohio, in December of 1879. Detective Snellbaker tried to track down Dr. Morton, but failed to find him. College doctors weren't willing to be forthcoming, with one admitting that anyone who gave the man up would receive the general hatred of all body snatchers, and might prevent the university in the future from obtaining an adequate supply of bodies for their studies. The outcomes of the Harrison's court cases are unknown. J.Q. Marshall was not convicted, but it isn't known if Dr. Morton was ever found or charged in connection with the crime. Several civil suits were also filed, but any records of what happened were lost when the Hamilton County Courthouse was burned during the Cincinnati Courthouse Riots of 1884. Benjamin Harrison's career skyrocketed during the 1880s, eventually taking him to the White House in 1889. The subject of his father's grave robbing was not something he or the rest of the family cared to recall. They said little of it after the affair was finished. The body snatching of John Scott Harrison led to many important changes. Five states passed new anatomy laws, which both increased the penalty for body snatching, but also made it easier for medical schools to obtain unclaimed bodies of people who had died in the care of the state. And while that reduced the demand for illicit bodies, it didn't eliminate it, and the trade continued into the 20th century. The second change affected the nature of burial itself. The Harrison Horror inspired a number of inventors to tackle the question of how to make coffins. Inventors in Ohio designed anti-grave robbing coffins, one of which would fire a shotgun-like device, and another which would explode like a landmine if the coffin was breached. While several instances of exploding coffins appear in newspapers and in patent applications, it doesn't appear that these inventions were ever actually installed. More practically, Andrew Van Bibber patented in 1878 the Mort Safe, the earliest example of a modern burial vault. The next year, George W. Boyd invented the first burial vault that utilized air sealing to close the vault itself. Today, burial vaults are mostly meant to protect bodies from the elements, but they began their existence protecting bodies from much more nefarious threats. The story of John Scott Harrison's body provides insights into the changing needs and struggles of a society as the Industrial Revolution, the flowering of science, and increased professionalism sought inroads into a nation that was already facing great change. The tug of war between the growing demands of science and social mores was further complicated by sluggish government oversight, which struggled to keep up with the pace of change. It's all part of the broader backdrop of the growing pains of an era of enormous societal rearrangement. And we are facing similar challenges in the pace of change today, which is all the more reason that history deserves to be remembered. So is Benjamin Harrison the most obscure president? <laughs> is I, it possible that's his dad? <laughs> I, I, you know, I think <laughs> or his grandfather, grandfather rather. I mean, ask people when the Harrisons were president. And I, I don't think they probably even know more or less what happened during the Harrison's presidencies. Again, it's more of that continuum's kind of period that's in between. Uh, but it is so fascinating that you have this one man in the middle who is the son of a president and the father of a president. And he himself was a congressman. Uh, and that, that just shows how that family was the power of Ohio at the time. Uh, so, yeah. and, and that, you know, this, the story is all around just insane. I mean, it's absolutely nuts and what they uncover because of the story and what was going on that might not have been uncovered if they had dug up the wrong dude. But uh, it's yeah. also uh, tells you something about this political family uh, that had such an impact to a period of history that again, we don't study very much. So, I mean, we might do some more talking about both of the Harrison administrations, yeah. but yeah, you have to say um, at least among the least known, most forgotten presidents in history are Beezer Harrison. Well, and apparently at the at the time, ben Benjamin was was known as kind of uh, bland. <laughs> he wasn't an especially uh, charismatic guy, but he this this story is such because even if it wasn't, even if it didn't essentially involve two U.S. presidents and this guy in the middle, who's the only person to have been both the son and the father of a U.S. president. It would have been incredible, even if it wasn't that. Yeah, this is a story worth telling. If these were just course, if this was just people, I mean, if they're yeah. Uh, yeah. You you go to you go to find the the cousin that you've just that you've just seen his grave disturbed and yeah. you find the person the father that and that's you your father your dad who I mean who you buried with a, like a ton of rocks on top of him just so that they couldn't do this yeah 
it has to it has i trying to imagine that moment when they find john scott harrison hanging from the from the rope i, I just, mean from his feet yeah from a rope i yeah. i just can't even i just can't even the shock and that's mm-hmm. i mean that's what makes that's a good part of what a good chunk of what makes the story so incredible yeah. is the idea that you're how, looking for someone else how it was discovered or that it wouldn't have been discovered and what you must have thought you know you're his son and you find and, and how it, the condition also that he was found in the way that he was treated yeah. and also that this has become this is so important to the medical industry this is such a secret to the to the, to the medical school that even though you are dealing with a u.s congressman the son of a president uh, that they still try to hide it and they hide the name of the person that they bought it from uh, and then yeah. you know the whole the whole weird morbid story where you find out then that they're using the basement of a college in the summer because it's closed and they're shoving them in pickle crates and it's just, it's, it's yeah. and they eventually find the cousin, you know, uh, uh, three states away. Yeah, it's, I yeah. mean, it's, it is, a, it is a crazy story. It is kind of a ghoulish story. Uh, it is a story about really about science and technology and how much medicine, uh, you know, how, how important it was that your doctor actually understood anatomy. But uh, and uh, this is this fight was going on. There was a, there was a riot about that before the revolution in in New York City. Uh, and uh, and and we're still facing that issue, and, and uh, today even still, I mean, it's different. I mean, uh, but uh, you still have that issue of how you acquire cadavers for medical study. So it's 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 another one of those. This you, you can't believe it. It is a story where the truth is stranger than fiction. I've never seen a, a movie with twists in the plot line like we find in the, in the Harrison horror. And again, it's, we, how many people even know about it? It's almost completely forgotten. Almost completely forgotten. And it's just the way that the medical the medical college fought back and was not at all ashamed. They essentially were like, "Well, wh- how else do you expect us to get bodies for heaven's sake?" And they, I, even though this was and. To be fair, the reason that there was something really done about this particular one was because he was a congressman, and a, the at that point this was before a Benjamin Harrison's term, so he was just the son of a president. But I mean that that's enough to make well, to make Benjamin headlines. Harrison was a leading politician at the time. Right? He was, yeah. yeah. And, and you see that you see his temperament really in this, and how careful he was uh, despite what was going on. But you also find out. I mean, you have to think that the nation had some idea that this was going on, but when it made the news, it really. Uh, inflamed the nation. They they, uh, they really saw this as you know as and I guess many of us still do as, as how ghoulish this was. Uh, and uh, so it's interesting because probably there were people whose own grandfather had been dug up and they didn't know. I mean, they never did know. I and mean, they might still think that their their, their grandpa's in that grave and they're not in that grave. Uh, I wonder how many gravestones in America are covering an empty coffin of someone who was taken out and, and dissected in the, in the 19th century. Uh, but uh, it was uh, this was uh, it absolutely shocked the nation that this was going on and it didn't shock the medical community. They were uh, and and, and, and the, it's just amazing to me that when you have this sort of force pressing down on you and they, they push back against it and, and they absolutely refuse to reveal this guy who never made it yeah. through med school who was pickling corpses that he stole out of cemeteries and that they because they were afraid that if they turned him in that they would never be able to get cadavers to run their medical school and they and they knew it was important they believed that it was really the only way that these doctors and to some extent i mean they were right about that that the doctors do have to learn this stuff and how else are they going to learn mm-hmm. it especially in um what with in the 1800s you know the late 1800s when they didn't have something like a computer or any i mean in order to even make you know the the drawings they had to have a cadaver so they could see what what it looked like well yeah you want your doctor to have you know seen the spleen before they start going and work on yours and at the time yeah. doctors were very much generalists and uh, uh-huh. you, you know you this was the only way necessarily they're going to learn this is this is part of a plot line in tom sawyer uh, and I mean, so it's it's and it's an issue that has been going on for hundreds of years by this point. But I think in the modern yeah. era, people were shocked that it was that was still going on uh, and it was going and, on so crassly. And apparently had been it was as long as they didn't have uh, someone important enough, it was just going to continue. Well, and I, then this was... take, I mean, it's kind of the answer to that was to say, well, we will do better identifying people who don't care. <laughs> that's what, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what... <laughs> well, we'll take some more, you know, of the sorts of people that you don't really mind. Uh, and we will uh, we will give them to the medical schools. I'm sure he wasn't the first person that was the famous person that was pulled out of there because they wouldn't have known uh, that he yeah. had been uh, that he had, had been uh, on, on Earth and sent to this medical school if they weren't searching for another reason. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they they ran into someone who was who was going to look, and then accidentally, honestly, just happened to find. Because I mean, with I, I don't know that it wouldn't have been the story that it was without if it was just the cousin. Yeah. But it makes me it makes me wonder if you're if you're the guy pulling corpses out, you see, 
someone who it's hard to imagine hard for me to imagine that you didn't have some idea of who was being buried there uh-huh. um or because i probably and we mentioned that in the stories that someone might have wa- was probably watched them do the uh-huh. uh, the burial watch and bury them yeah go and saw the security the... that they used to bury so they knew where to how to remove it yeah they they were just very adept at it uh, and they, yeah. they might have been looking for certain types of people or there might be reasons that they want to but i mean it's you, you have to you, you have to think that whoever did that had an idea because um, it would have been on the gravestone this is a u.s congressman that they were digging up yeah. and, and, and pulling over there so i mean there's you know, there's a lot of interesting abuse of the corpses in u.s history lincoln's corpse was stolen for a while and uh, it's it's interesting because it's it's morbid or whatever. But this the tie to science and medicine at the time, the, the extent to which the nation is shocked, and then you tie that then to this one person, the link between two presidencies, and it really makes for a, a, an amazing story and one that's amazing that isn't isn't much better now. It's it's uh, the, the, the nation doesn't talk about it. Just like just like the Cleveland story, mm-hmm. this is one that ends up connecting so amazingly to the changes that were going on in the Gilded Age. And I think that that's one of the ways that this is makes such an interesting episode is that you're able to talk about the truly interesting story and then go beyond that and talk about how this was affecting so many different things. And you're right. They do essentially they're like, well, if we if we're picking up the bodies of like drunks and homeless people, at least then <laughs> we yeah, have to have the bodies. Up. Yeah, they, they they essentially decide that you know the the medical industry had to have these bodies. Yeah, they and did. It wasn't a particularly uh, a good way for them to get them. So yeah, they just decide. Well, we won't. We will have a, a moral thorough system of picking up people that no one's going to miss. And, uh, but they they were apparently doing it for years, and it was. I think people people at least kind of knew. I, it was there. Were, there were yeah, I think I, I think they had to. Yeah, and and there and there are many other stories. I mean, there might be more episodes on these, you know, these grave robber guys that were some of them that were you know, prolific in what they yeah. did. But I mean, if you uh, you wonder if the uh, if the students that were going in that college realized it in the summer or that what they were doing <laughs> inside. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's. Uh, I kind of no, feel like some of them decided that we'll just not ask to too close a question yeah, about so, so, so the smell the smell from. funny in here well yeah the, the medical schools didn't want to ask at all they didn't want anybody yeah. they didn't want to ask any questions because they knew they would lose their supply of corpses yeah. and that uh, this is not just an american issues that these same issues arise all over the world uh and, and so it's it, it just fascinating i mean it's, it's a it's a it happened in a lot of places uh, but this is a really particularly interesting story to talk about that and one that particularly brought it to the, the attention of the public uh and uh is one that still i mean Today, now, you know, you, you put that donor card on your when you get your driver's license. And it's, it's, but also, I think we see largely uh, see uh, cadavers and corpses and afterlife and everything a little bit differently today. And fewer and fewer people of even my generation are looking to be buried, you know. And it's, uh, it also shows how that's a changing sensibility. So we've yeah. got several episodes that talk about how people use mortal remains. And it's, it's extraordinary, you know, how that impacts us as, as a people. Uh, and and how that shows that you know changes transformations in history and and our scientific views and our cultural views and our religious views uh, as we try to decide who we're going to be as a nation. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed these stories of forgotten history, and if you did, you can find more on our YouTube channel at the History Guy. History deserves to be remembered. We will continue to release podcasts every other week, so stick around if you want more podcasts on forgotten history. You can also find us on our website, thehistoryguy.net, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Rumble, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.